They were the two largest conflicts in human history, and the weapons used in both conflicts shaped warfare for generations to come. But how do the deadliest weapons of World War I and World War II compare? First, we're starting off with the First World War with an invention that was meant to protect cattle, but was almost immediately adopted for military use – barbed wire. The first patent for a form of barbed wire fencing was issued to Léonce Grassin Baladon in 1860s France, but it was an American and Illinois farmer Joseph F. Gilden who is credited with inventing barbed wire as we know it today. His invention was one of necessity. How do you keep 500-pound cows and bulls from roaming away and escaping or getting themselves into trouble? You could use traditional rock fencing or heavy post fencing, though both were very labor and time intensive to create, not to mention expensive for a poor farmer. Gildan's solution was brilliantly simple. He simply strung up two twisted strands of wire that had evenly spaced sharpened barbs in place. The twisted strands guaranteed that when an animal pushed against the fencing to try to escape, it would be met with many sharp barbs. The pain from the barbs would immediately deter even the angriest bull from trying to break through the fence. The fence could be mass-produced, thus lowering cost, and a small team could install hundreds of yards of fencing in a single day. It was a brilliant solution that almost immediately caught the attention of military commanders around the world. Barbed wire saw use in every major conflict in the turn of the 20th century, though it came to particularly devilish use during the First World War. While the machine gun was responsible for the trench warfare tactics we saw in the conflict and is seen as the most influential weapon of the war, few knew that without barbed wire the machine gun would have been far less effective than it ended up being and it was all in the way that it was deployed. As an offensive weapon, barbed wire is useless, but as a defensive weapon, barbed wire proved to be deadly for both sides of the conflict. A common tactic was to lay down belts of barbed wire in a zigzag pattern that was from 30 feet to 100 feet wide, sometimes even more. This meant that the enemy infantry had to cut through multiple tangles of the stuff just to make any progress, instead of just laying them down as independent strands, which could be cut much easier and faster. While that infantry was busy trying to cut through the barbed wire, the enemy could rain rifle and machine gun fire on them. Just a few strands of barbed wire could effectively bring an assault of thousands to a dead standstill, pun fully intended. However, barbed wire could also be used to funnel enemy soldiers into massive killing fields, and this is where it proved to be at its most deadly. Machine guns and artillery could all be zeroed in on a pre-planned killing field, making them deadly accurate against advancing enemy infantry. An account from the Battle of Soma highlights how deadly barbed wire had become. Those Newfoundlanders who did reach their own wire, four well-laid belts and all, had to follow zigzag lanes between pre-cut gaps which had been exactly pinpointed by German machine gunners. Those who managed to get through those gaps had to cross 500 yards of open ground exposed to German positions. Those Newfoundlanders who had reached the German wire were shot down as they tried to cut their way through it with their wire cutters. Both sides came up with attempts to defeat barbed wire, one of which was to use special mats that one could lay over the obstacle and provide safety for advancing soldiers. However, one misstep would see you tumble into a mass of the stuff, completely entangling you while you also lacerated and mauled your flesh. Hopelessly stuck, your only hope was that your side won the engagement and a rescue party could come later and cut you out. Or you could take your chances simply tearing free of the stuff, an extremely unenviable proposition. The Bangalore torpedo was also developed as a way of defeating barbed wire. It consisted of a series of five-foot lengths of pipe which could be screwed together and were filled with explosives. Then, the entire assembly was shoved through the wire and the fuse lit. The resulting explosion would clear a five-foot path through the stuff. However, this meant that you would be exposed to enemy fire the entire time you were busy assembling your torpedo and waiting for the fuse to go off. It was the development of one of the deadliest weapons of World War II that led to the end of barbed wire's reign as one of the most feared tools on the battlefield. While barbed wire would continue to be used throughout World War II to protect defensive positions, the tank with its thick armor and wide treads could easily smash through the stuff. Thus, the use of barbed wire dropped steeply after World War I, though it remains in use around the world for its excellent anti-personnel properties. It just isn't as effective as it once was thanks to the proliferation of armored vehicles. Our next deadliest weapon would have its infancy in World War I, but would be responsible for almost knocking an entire country out of the war before it even joined World War II. The Airplane Almost from the advent of powered flight, man saw its potential for war, but it would take a few years for its true potential to be discovered. Before the airplane, armies relied on mounted scouts or even hot air balloons to conduct reconnaissance, but the advent of a fast mobile platform that gave its pilot a bird's eye view of a battlefield proved to be an absolute game changer. Now it was possible to get detailed tactical information not just on an enemy's front lines, but deep behind them. Valuable information that could be passed along to the artillery corps and used to destroy enemy supply depots and command posts 
not visible to scouts on the ground or operating from stationary balloons. It was at the First Battle of Marna when the airplane first proved itself an exceptionally valuable tool for any military and prompted the need to defend one's own skies against enemy airplanes. During this battle, Allied reconnaissance planes were able to spot a gap in the German lines that was not visible from the ground. The Allies soon massed an attack against this gap and succeeded in splitting the German line, forcing them to retreat or be overwhelmed. It was clear that the airplane was necessary for modern war and that it was just as necessary to keep the friendly skies clear of them. The first scout planes had no armaments and instead pilots would engage in shootouts with each other using revolvers. With a pressing need to destroy enemy scout aircraft though, engineers on both sides of the lines worked to develop armament that could be fitted on an airplane that had the ability to shoot enemy planes out of the sky. The first such weapons consisted of carefully timed machine guns that were directly linked to the plane's propeller and thus could shoot through the rapidly spinning blades without damaging them. These were known as synchronization gears. The first synchronization gear to enter service was fitted on a German Fokker Eindecker fighter and proved to be mostly reliable. Gradually, the technology improved to the point that fewer and fewer pilots were shooting their own propellers off. It wouldn't be until the 1930s that these types of machine guns would go out of style. Armed with machine guns, planes could now attack and destroy each other effectively, keeping nosy enemy scouts from getting a good fix on your troops down below. However, on top of this, from the onset of powered flight, it also became obvious that the airplane could be an excellent tool for dropping bombs on the enemy with far greater accuracy than artillery. However, this would remain a pipe dream for most of the war due to the technological limitations of early engines. In place of bombs, some planes carried great loads of sharpened wood darts that were light enough to allow a plane to carry hundreds of them at a time. However, the darts were completely unguided and their effectiveness was limited, though they did succeed at causing casualties on the ground and the French used them all the way to the end of the war. Early planes were able to carry some explosives but would need to drop them from low altitudes to have any hope of hitting their targets due to how light the explosives were. This in turn exposed the airplane to withering ground fire. With the development of more powerful engines, planes were able to carry larger loads at higher altitudes and by the end of the war the bomber aircraft began to come into its own. After World War I though, few people saw the potential of the airplane. American General William Lendrum Mitchell, however, had seen how revolutionary air power would quickly become, but his efforts to convince a staunchly traditionalist military would end up costing him his career. Mitchell argued that the airplane would be the most important weapon of any future conflict. Despite the increasing lethality of airplanes in the First World War, many of Mitchell's contemporaries disagreed and believed that traditional artillery and battleships were more important than airplanes. Mitchell would go on to stage a series of demonstrations by sinking decommissioned battleships using bombs, but they proved unconvincing to army leadership. For his incessant campaigning for an expanded air force, Mitchell would annoy his superiors to the point that they demoted him to colonel. When he accused the army and navy leadership of almost treasonable administration of the national defense after investing in battleships instead of aircraft carriers, Mitchell was court-martialed and he resigned shortly after. Mitchell would die in 1936, but the entire world would realize he had been correct all along after his death when on December 7, 1941, out of the blue, a massive Japanese air attack nearly wiped out the U.S. Pacific Fleet. The U.S. was mostly left with its aircraft carriers in the Pacific for the early years of the war, which it employed to devastating effect against the Japanese. This sealed the fate of the battleship and proved that Mitchell had been correct all along. If U.S. military leadership had listened to him in 1925, the U.S. would have crushed Japan years earlier than it did with its massive fleet of aircraft carriers, instead of investing in slow, inaccurate battleships. In Europe, though, Germany also proved how deadly the airplane had become by brilliantly incorporating it into its blitzkrieg strategy. Air attacks would overwhelm enemy defenses with aerial bombardment, and the war even saw the airplane used as direct fire support for troops on the ground. Dive bombers were very effective for destroying enemy tanks with pinpoint accuracy, and few were as feared as the Junkers Ju-87 or Stuka. They even came equipped with an air siren, which would let out a horrifying wail as the plane dove on a target, further demoralizing the men on the ground. Fighters equipped with heavy machine guns and cannons could also strafe enemy positions and destroy armored vehicles with far greater accuracy than artillery fire or offshore fire support. By the end of the war, the airplane had become one of the most important advancements in the history of military technology. Our next most deadly weapon, though, continues to haunt the imaginations of people to this day and led to global action to ban its use in further conflicts. Poison gas Sometimes it was invisible and odorless, other times it came with a distinct sharp smell that preceded a sickly yellowish fog drifting over the landscape toward you. It was indiscriminate, and a change in the wind would end up killing friend and foe alike. Poison gas was without a doubt one of the worst weapons of World War I. 
France was the first to use gas with canisters of tear gas lobbed at German positions in hopes of making their positions easier to assault. However, tear gas was at best an irritant that would cause uncontrolled tearing and difficulty breathing with symptoms clearing up within half an hour. This made the gas not particularly effective. Then Germany upped the ante significantly. Rather than use irritant gases, Germany decided that the most humane thing to do was to use deadly gases so as to secure a swift victory, preventing even greater casualties on both sides from prolonged fighting. Thus, in April 1915, Germany debuted the use of chlorine gas against the Allied lines. The gas is denser than air, meaning it would settle in low areas and move along the ground, perfect for infiltrating enemy trenches and killing soldiers within. At low doses, it causes coughing, vomiting, and extreme eye irritation. However, unprotected soldiers could inhale the gas, after which it would react with the water inside their lungs, creating hydrochloric acid. The acid would then just eat away at the lungs, causing suffocation or severe lung scarring for survivors. In just its first use, an estimated 1,100 soldiers were killed. But the gas was so surprisingly effective that the Germans weren't ready to exploit the situation. But chlorine gas had serious problems. For starters, its odor and color made it easy to spot, giving sharp-eyed soldiers a chance to quickly don protective gear. The gas was also water-soluble, so a simple wet rag over the mouth and nose was enough to protect a soldier. Next, the Germans unleashed phosgene gas, which was colorless and nearly undetectable at low concentrations, which was still enough to result in deadly effects. The gas reacted with the proteins in the alveoli of the lungs, disrupting the blood-air barrier and causing suffocation. Highly effective, the gas is thought to be responsible for up to 85% of the 91,000 gas deaths in the conflict. But the gas acted slowly and could take up to two days to cause a death through buildup of fluid in the lungs. For at least one of those days, soldiers could still put up some resistance, making it unsuitable for preparatory bombardments. The most common gas used in World War I was mustard gas, so called for its mustard color. While in pure form it's colorless, impure forms of the gas were widely used in World War I, giving it a distinct coloring and an odor similar to garlic or horseradish. The gas was not commonly deadly unless someone inhaled large quantities of it, but it was feared because even on contact with unprotected skin, it would cause large blisters which oozed yellowish fluids. These chemical burns made fighting difficult for those injured, and the blisters opened them up to more serious infections in the extremely unsanitary trenches of World War I. Often, other gases would be used, such as chloropicrin, before a second round of gas attacks. These special gases were irritants, posing little threat to life but could bypass gas masks and would often make soldiers remove their gas masks as they suffered coughing or vomiting fits. Then, the second deadlier gas could be introduced to unprotected soldiers leading to death. Ironically, gases were banned by the Hague Convention of 1899, though to obvious little effect. While gases proved to be less deadly than their ordinary rifles, accounting for between 1 to 2 percent of casualties in World War I, they were extremely effective terror weapons that severely demoralized the enemy. After the war, they were banned again by the Geneva Protocol of 1925, with countries super pinky promising that this time they were serious and they wouldn't use them in war. In the Second World War, the Western powers did not use gas, though were prepared to do so. Japan feared a similar retaliation by Western armies, so used poison gases only against Chinese and other Asian forces who were viewed as inferior and lacked the technological sophistication to create weaponized gases themselves. Thus, the Japanese could launch gas attacks with little fear of their troops being gassed back. Knowing that the Japanese were using gas against other Asian countries, Australia imported poison gas from the UK and stored it in underground bunkers in case of invasion. If the Japanese unleashed poison gas against Australian forces, the Australians were ready to respond in kind. Despite not using it against Western armies, the Japanese did use Western POWs as guinea pigs in several experiments using poison gas. It's long been rumored that due to having been gassed in World War I, Hitler refused to use weapons in the Second World War, but that's not correct. The real reason that Germany did not use gas weapons was because its military lacked the technical capability to mass-produce poison gas for use on a battlefield. The Germans had approximately 45,000 tons of poison gas, but Hitler knew that the Allies had far more in reserve, and he feared an overwhelming retaliation. After their defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad, Hitler was urged to use poison gas in order to slow the advance of the Russians. Once more, Hitler feared an overwhelming retaliatory attack from the Allies. However, Hitler still ordered production of Tabun and sarin gases to be doubled. He ordered that chemical weapon stockpiles not be moved to the Russian front, though, fearful that a rogue officer would use them and spark an Allied retaliation. 
After the invasion of Italy, the Germans quickly either moved or destroyed their own and Italy's chemical weapon stockpiles for fear that again a rogue commander would order them used on Allied soldiers. Gas could have prevented the Normandy invasion though and turned it into a strategic disaster. When asked why gas wasn't used, Hermann Göring later stated that as the Wehrmacht relied on horse-drawn transportation for resupply of their combat units and they had never been able to design a gas mask that a horse would tolerate and allowed sufficient air to pass for a horse to pull a cart, deploying a gas would harm the war effort more than it aided it. The Germans did use chemical weapons and extermination efforts though, using toxic smoke to force Russian resistance fighters out of their positions in the caverns beneath the city of Sevastopol. They also used asphyxiating gas in the catacombs of Odessa in November 1941 and in late May 1942 during the Battle of the Kirk Peninsula in eastern Crimea. After the battle, around 3,000 Red Army soldiers and civilians were besieged in a series of caves and tunnels in the Adzimushkai Quarry, and after three months of resistance, the Nazis finally released poison gases into the tunnels, killing most of them. Infamously, the Nazis used poison gas during the war, but not against fighting troops, but to murder millions of what they called undesirables. Though the Allies did not use chemical weapons, they were fully prepared to do so. The British created large stockpiles and moved them close to the southern coast, in anticipation of German invasion. In case of said invasion, the British were fully prepared to use gas against the amphibious assaults. The Allies also prepared massive quantities of gas to be loaded onto planes to use against German cities if the Germans used their own poison gas, especially during the D-Day landings. Such an attack would have prompted a massive poison gas bombing campaign against German civilians, killing tens of thousands. Churchill was a strong proponent of using poison gas and was restrained only by his military leadership. He wrote a secret memorandum to his military chiefs urging them to strongly consider the use of poison gas against even civilian targets so as to shorten the war, writing, it is absurd to consider morality on this topic when everybody used it in the last war without a word of complaint. The US meanwhile developed deadly blood agents for use with their new bazooka launchers. These agents could penetrate the protective barriers of some gas masks and were seen as especially effective against Japanese troops holding out inside caves and bunkers. However, despite developing large stockpiles of the deadly gas, the US never used it. Our next deadly weapon also had its start in World War I, but while the rest of the world struggled to employ it, Nazi Germany made deadly use of it. Tanks September 1916 was the dawn of tank warfare. On a brisk fall morning, a small group of massive armored behemoths chugged along at four miles an hour, picking their way toward the front. Then, to the shock of German onlookers, the massive metal monsters began the long, slow journey across no man's land toward the trenches. Rifle and even machine gun fire proved completely ineffective. Nothing seemed it could stop the massive death machines. As combustion engines became more powerful, they could be used to propel even heavier machines. This led to a rise in armored cars, but cars were useless in trench warfare of World War I as they could only operate on roads. The British began to rethink the entire concept of an armored car and devise a machine that could help them break the deadlock of trench warfare. The result would be called the Tank a code name given to hide the true nature of the top secret British project. Any wayward spy hearing the name would simply think the British were developing new water tanks to rehydrate their troops. In actuality, the British had designed massive monsters of iron and steel. The lumbering beasts had tracks that encircled the entire body and allowed them to simply drive straight over trenches, and instead of turret-mounted weapons like we see today, it had side-mounted cannons and machine guns to fire down into trenches from above. The thick armor made the vehicle immune to small arms fire of any kind, though the extremely slow speed of early tanks made them vulnerable to artillery fire. Inside of the cramped quarters was a crew of eight, a tank commander, driver, four gunners, and two men who helped shift gears. At the very height of the machine was a massive engine, which was not properly ventilated, running the risk of suffocating the crew. To make matters even worse, the engine would drive up the temperature inside the tank to unbearable degrees. With no suspension, the big lumbering beast would make for a horribly bumpy ride and be complete hell to operate. Despite this, tanks were quickly employed and made their first appearance on September 15, 1916. The British Army massed 49 tanks for an assault on the German trenches outside the village French of Flair. However, many of the tanks never even made it to their starting positions, breaking down en route. Even after the battle commenced, many of the tanks would break down or just plain get stuck on the many craters of no man's land. Only nine tanks managed to achieve their goals inside enemy lines, but the British were satisfied enough with the results to go all in on tanks. Early tanks experienced frequent breakdowns and the interior conditions were almost as dangerous for the crew as the battlefield outside. As the war progressed, Germany developed armor-piercing ammunition that could pierce the 8mm thick side armor, so the British doubled down and made the armor even thicker. 
This prompted the development of the first anti-tank rifle, the German TAC 1918. A more practical solution was simply to bundle a few grenades together and hurl them directly at the tank. If exploding close enough to it, the explosion could kill the crew inside through spalding of the metal armor. By the Second World War, though, tanks were an indispensable tool of any modern military, and fierce competition between both sides led to the development of better armed and armored tanks. It was the Germans who employed them the most effectively at the start of the war. Despite their appearance in the First World War, the rest of the world still largely failed to appreciate the true potential of the tank. Thus, it was doctrine in most armies to spread tanks out and use them as infantry support platforms. The Germans instead concentrated their tanks into individual units and used them as a spearhead to break enemy defenses, allowing supporting infantry to exploit the gap created by the armored assault. The tactic was the cornerstone of the German Blitzkrieg and was soon copied by Western powers. The Second World War would see some of the greatest tank battles in history, many of them on the Eastern Front. Even in the Pacific, tanks were employed by both the Japanese and the Americans, though American tanks would prove to be far superior to their Japanese counterparts. By the end of the Second World War, it was official. No army could hope for victory without the copious use of main battle tanks. Now go check out Deadliest Weapons of World War III for a sneak peek into our immediate future, or click this other video instead.